brace yourself. Kingdom Hearts 3 is out. Really, that's something that I couldn't envision myself ever saying, not for a long time anyway. Not to say this game was never going to be released, but I just couldn't picture myself being able to say that truthfully. Over the course of more than a decade since Kingdom Hearts 2, this game became just as much a myth as it was a meme. With the constant teasing and slow trickle of information about the game's development, it was pretty hard to take this game's existence seriously, especially for people on the outside looking in. But yeah, Kingdom Hearts 3, a game that became one of the poster children of development limbo, is actually available on store shelves. It's a weird feeling, yeah, but as dramatic as it sounds, the release of Kingdom Hearts 3 was a special moment for me. This was a series that I had an arc over. While Kingdom Hearts 1 was the game that got me to buy a PlayStation 2 and Kingdom Hearts 2 was the game that truly engrossed me in the series, anything beyond that, for a while anyway, was kept at a distance. What had truly entranced me in my teen years felt strange and foreign to me in my adulthood. The hoops that Tetsuya Nomura and his team wanted me to jump through became too abstract and off-kilter for me to follow, and all of that luster that the earlier titles had was beginning to wear off, leaving a rusty mess beneath. 358 over 2 days, Birth by Sleep, Dream Drop Distance, none of those games had the power that Kingdom Hearts 1, 2, and even Chain of Memories had over me. I was starting to say to myself, this series isn't interesting anymore. But in retrospect, I feel I was being too hard on the series. In some weird way, I don't think I was putting in the effort, because for all of its convoluted and off-putting elements, I do feel like I owed a lot of my gaming experiences and tastes to Kingdom Hearts as a series. So, a couple years ago, I decided to take a deep breath and dive back in. I began my journey to catch up on all of the required reading that I missed and prepare myself for Kingdom Hearts 3, whenever it was coming. I picked up the HD re-releases and blasted through each game in its entirety. Through cutscene after cutscene, world after world, boss fight after boss fight with their fucking enormous health bars, I wrapped it all up. And after capping off with 0.2 Birth by Sleep A Fragmentary Passage, I was ready for Kingdom Hearts 3. Totally, confidently ready because through all of its moments of silliness, Kingdom Hearts is a franchise that's managed to carry itself far. It's a damn good series, and Kingdom Hearts 3, intentional or not, doesn't break that tradition. You see, Kingdom Hearts 3 is both the easiest and hardest game I've had to critique in a very long time. Despite having flaws that are almost shameless in their visibility, despite the level of hype building up to the game's release, and, with props to Nomura and his team, Despite a winding story that's been begging for an ounce of closure for years now, Kingdom Hearts 3 has issues. But at the same time, these are issues that struggle to bother me. In spite of everything riding on this game's success, or even just its existence, Kingdom Hearts 3 is a game that I can't help but enjoy. You don't have any choice but to follow this sweet little trail of breadcrumbs. And at the end, you'll finally realize what destiny has in store for you. You don't need me or anyone else to tell you that the narrative of Kingdom Hearts has dug itself quite a hole. Not to say the series can't dig itself out of that hole, but the odds were stacked against it going into Kingdom Hearts 3. What began as a light-hearted romp through Disney worlds, taking on villains from classic films, and ultimately finding a nice mix of symbolism and philosophy in its themes, Kingdom Hearts has become a series that's managed to become so much bigger than that initial pitch of Disney cross Final Fantasy. Themes of identity, social completion, along with interpersonal and intrapersonal connections, there have been so many detours and arcs that have since jettisoned this series into a whole other dimension of storytelling. The narrative on its own is dense, for better or worse, and the fact that nearly all of the games in the series existed on different consoles at one point didn't make the story feel organic. The games were connected, but by some bizarre circumstance loosely enough that almost every title had at least a bit of self-containment, and with that self-containment, essential storyline elements that quickly became required reading. Kingdom Hearts always tried to give each game its own importance, its own place in the mythos, and that did more to convolute the narrative than give the games their own kind of essentiality. With the PS4 remasters and the collective release the story so far, the multi-console debacle is pretty much solved at this point. And yes, I totally understand the tedium of having to retrace a series' steps to attain that sense of conscious completion. That being said, 
Kingdom Hearts 3's story is remarkable in how straight ahead it is. Despite still grappling with the remnants of that extensive, philosophy-dripped narrative structure, Kingdom Hearts 3 is the closest game since Kingdom Hearts 2 to deliver upon the game's original premise of exploring various worlds from Disney feature films and encountering the characters from those films. This is definitely apparent in the best worlds like those from Toy Story, Monsters, Inc., and Big Hero 6, each of which have self-contained narratives that also don't really have to do too much to fit into the overarching story of Kingdom Hearts 3. They feel just as accommodating to Sora's presence as they do to the players. Familiarity and nuance are at a fine balance in these cases. This is all the more noticeable in the less successful worlds where these elements are taken away. For Tangled and Frozen, the effort appears to be pushed in establishing iconic moments from the films instead of delivering the balance of the familiar and the adventurous. There's a segregation in these worlds. They lack the united essence of Kingdom Hearts' ethos. The characters and worlds don't need Sora present to be what they are, and that's quite the disappointment. Yes, the musical numbers in Frozen's world are redundant if you've already seen the film, but even as someone who hasn't seen many of the films that are represented in Kingdom Hearts 3, I didn't find them to be enlightening or even give me much incentive to go out and watch the films. The Tangled world manages to do better than the Frozen world, if anything because its story felt more compelling, despite sending Sora, Donald, and Goofy to the bench for its best and most memorable narrative moments. But don't take this issue as a narrative blunder on the whole, because Kingdom Hearts 3 manages to succeed far more than it fails here. As I already mentioned, the Pixar worlds and Big Hero 6s are fantastically presented, and I'd go so far as to say that the Pirates of the Caribbean level is equally engrossing, mostly because the tone is preserved amongst its cast. Jack Sparrow is still a whimsical character, and his devil-may-care behavior definitely matches up with Sora's reckless, but well-meaning feelings. I think tone is where things come together the best. Kingdom Hearts always gave its lighthearted moments and the serious Xehanort themes a balance, letting them intertwine at times, but not at the expense of either. Kingdom Hearts 2 did this very well, despite being a catalyst in making the narrative as dense as it is right now. In retrospect, I think the 2.9 prologue is a great opener for 3, because it eases the player into how much the Disney and Kingdom Hearts narratives are willing to overlap. Olympus is a real showcase on a stylistic and gameplay level, but it doesn't hurl the player into a lake without a life preserver expecting them to learn how to swim. Instead, it's lighthearted and cartoony. Hades is still one of the most entertaining Disney villains in all of Kingdom Hearts, so it's great to see him return, especially so early in the game. While Olympus is a red herring in just how much the Xehanort story appears in each Disney world, I definitely appreciate the accommodation, while also keeping the world feeling energetic and fun. Kingdom Hearts 3, for all of the baggage that it tows, manages to keep the darker Xehanort elements at an arm's length when you're exploring the Disney worlds. The guys and gals in the black coats make appearances, but solely for there to be a bad guy looming over it all. The Monsters Incorporated, Tangled, and Pirates of the Caribbean worlds do have their own in-universe villains, and I'd say that these come pretty close to the standard of KH1 and KH2's Disney bad guy moments. They're no Jafar or Oogie Boogie, but I appreciate Disney villains still having a bit of presence throughout Kingdom Hearts 3. But what about the Xehanort stuff? His cavalcade of clones and copies still up here, and despite what I said earlier, there still is a level of density here. The interludes between major worlds show what the new organization is up to, but the actual congregation of these plot points is sporadically placed. They act as reminders more than progressions, and unlike a lot of the world-exclusive narratives, they aren't as propulsive. The main story really stays out of the way for most of the game, aside from the organization making pretty inconsequential appearances in each of the worlds. This lacks the natural integration of both elements, Disney and Kingdom Hearts, of the previous games. The Disney villains of KH1, for example, acted as progressions for both the world-exclusive Disney stories and the overarching Kingdom Hearts story. Kingdom Hearts 2, with its Organization 13 antagonist, did less of this admittedly, but there still was a sense of unity between these two parts, which preserved the series' tone. Kingdom Hearts 3 definitely skimps on that a bit, which is kind of a disappointment, though I will say that for a story this far into the deep end, it was bound to happen in some way. It's only until the ending hours of Kingdom Hearts 3 that the main story really takes off, but it does so incredibly well. The fight with Aqua in the Realm of Darkness is a much refined version of those character battles from past games, but it's the scene after the cast escapes the Realm of Darkness with Aqua in tow that really shines. I can't praise this scene enough. From Aqua wondering when Destiny Islands fell to the darkness, to Riku delivering the news that Aqua's not in the Realm of Darkness anymore, to her steady realization that she's finally free, it's by far a highlight of the game, one of the most touching moments of the entire series. 
The revival of Ventus doesn't match the emotional weight of the aforementioned scene, but it comes very close. And hearing Ven thank Sora for keeping his heart safe is another fantastic set piece that delivers so much in so little time. With most of the team back on board, things pick up the pace considerably, beginning to clean up the story's lingering bits. Characters reunite, enemies are defeated, and the final battle closes in. Despite my original thoughts on the game's quote-unquote rushed pacing in these last few hours, I grew to feel that these resolutions are structured and performed well. The reunions between the 358 over 2 cast and the Birth by Sleep cast are amazingly heartfelt, easily joining Aqua and Ventus' rescues as fantastic highlights of the game's story. It wipes away the blemishes with excellent voice acting performances and cinematic tact. Seeing these characters finally overcome such arduous ordeals is so, so satisfying. When it comes to how Xehanort himself is resolved, his voluntary surrender was inevitable. At this point, he's sacrificed so many people's livelihoods and attained an almost omnipotent form, so I think this is really the best, if not the only possible way to wrap things up cleanly. It's not the only series that has done this, convincing the main villain to give up at the end of the line. In fact, one of my favorite manga series did something similar, so I'm not entirely against this direction. For Kingdom Hearts 3, it's performed in a touching way, especially with his friend Ericus making amends to his pupils and giving Xehanort the last push towards laying down his arms and moving on. So for all that's been said and done, is Kingdom Hearts 3's story good? Well, I don't think that's the question to be asked. I'd ask, does Kingdom Hearts 3's story fulfill its goal? I do think it does, in spite of all of its problems. There wasn't a chance that the game would live up to the theories and expectations of the fans, but I gotta admire Nomura and Crew's conviction to deliver an end to the Xehanort saga without making it feel improper in the context of the series' tones and themes. For all I've said, I'm satisfied with Kingdom Hearts 3's story, but it took me a long time to discover that. After finishing the game for the first time, my initial impressions aligned with a lot of detractors, it took an additional playthrough to find the value that Namur and his team were constructing. This is still a one-of-a-kind series, and I don't think any other franchise has established a mythos like Kingdom Hearts. I've grown to appreciate its narrative, cumbersome quirks and all, and seeing this saga finally come to a close is so much more deserving of my attention than the nitpicks I could easily state. Kingdom Hearts 3's story fulfilled its goal. Now, I know I'm not alone in saying that a majority of my excitement for this game was for its story. Closure of this magnitude is satiating, I'll say that much, but for everything I've said about Kingdom Hearts 3 on a narrative level, don't mistake that as indifference towards its mechanics and design, because I still think that Kingdom Hearts has always had brilliant gameplay. Well, I should probably be specific and say Kingdom Hearts 1 and 2 have always had brilliant gameplay. The different spin-offs and side stories, regardless of their essentiality on a narrative level, really lacked focus when it came to actually playing them. There was always some new bizarre system that was implemented, forcing players to learn new rules and stipulations while adjusting to things like cooldowns and skill decks. For the time when these side stories were in full swing, Kingdom Hearts lacked an internal gameplay identity, and I believe that was to the series' detriment. That's why A Fragmentary Passage was so enlightening to me. This felt like a balanced melding of all of the best elements of the non-numbered games. Yes, things got a bit repetitive with mashing the X button so much, but I can't deny how smooth combat felt, while also providing enough depth to keep things interesting. Look, I'm not a super technical player. I don't know much about specific combat builds or loadouts. Leave that to the speedrunners. For me, anyway, the elegance of Kingdom Hearts' best combat moments came from flow. Despite having heavy emphasis on role-playing staples like experience, equipment, and leveling up stats, none of it was a reliance. Kingdom Hearts can be enjoyed by many different kinds of gamers, whether you're a number-crunching RPG fan or a stylish, action-driven fan. But A Fragmentary Passage felt like Namur and crew going back to basics, ditching some of the more cumbersome systems and refining the ones that worked. Kingdom Hearts 3 plays similarly to A Fragmentary Passage, but its additions definitely give it its own flavor. The toolbox is filled to the brim this time around. Combos move and flow naturally, magic can stack for powerful finishers, party member attacks occur commonly, shot lock, link summons, attraction attacks, keyblade form changes, there are so many options that it borders on overwhelming. But what Kingdom Hearts 3 manages to pull off so well is tying all these moves together for slick, fluid battles. This is a concentric combat system. The mechanics and skills all orbit a common theme of flow. 
You can quickly jump from a melee combo into a form change, then use a magic attack, activate a partner's ability, and achieve the killing blow with your new Keyblade special finisher. All things considered, I really enjoyed the combat in Kingdom Hearts 3. It hits such a sweet spot, and unlike many of the spin-offs combat systems, this one is as straight ahead and centralized as Kingdom Hearts 1 and 2's were. But that mentality doesn't come without its caveats. For some reason, Kingdom Hearts 3 has significantly trimmed down its difficulty. Even playing on proud mode, I only died a handful of times, and most of these were from, I guess I'll say cheap, camera missteps. While I appreciate easing up on the horrifically bloated health bars this time around, I feel things lacked the satisfaction of striking down an enemy who's caused you agony for several rounds. Between huge magic buffs and a significant amount of iframes during attraction commands, this game doesn't hinder the player much whatsoever, leading to a much more relaxed difficulty. While I personally find punishing difficulty settings to be obnoxious, I'm not a pro, I promise you, Kingdom Hearts 3 felt unusually mellow for a Kingdom Hearts game. Even Kingdom Hearts 1, for all its relaxed atmosphere and lighthearted confrontations, still drove the stakes in with its boss beasts in the Colosseum, and KH2 did similar. But Kingdom Hearts 3 is, for lack of a better term, a more chill game, and I can find value in that. Now, don't assume I'm saying that games need to be easier, or Kingdom Hearts should let you skip combat or any of that, because that's not what I'm saying at all. What I am saying is that a more streamlined combat experience can serve a game if its design is more obtuse and experimental in response, and that's where I think Kingdom Hearts 3's more daring bits appear. Kingdom Hearts levels are a controversial subject. While expansive and puzzle-driven levels are appreciated by one section of the fanbase, simple and straightforward levels that build on combat breath are appreciated by another. For me, as much as I enjoy the combat and pacing of Kingdom Hearts 2, my favor leans on the more explorative, puzzle-driven levels, such as the stages of Kingdom Hearts 1. So where does 3 sit? Well, that's honestly a tough nut to crack, because there's far more going on under the hood this time around. I've said my piece of which worlds accommodate Sora, Donald, and Goofy's presence the best, but that isn't limited to the narrative. When the main trio is really able to interact with the characters and world, the level design definitely benefits. The Toy Story World Toy Box makes a fantastic impression, with its mobile mech toys, creepily animated doll boss, and genuine thriving of personality. The sections of each level are able to stand out with unique architecture and visual theming, without being held back by self-contained Disney stories. The same can be said of Monstropolis, with its autonomous machinery and industrial corridors. And similar to their narrative hiccups, the tangled and frozen levels lack the creativity and personality of other stages. Frozen's world is especially egregious, as a dull ice labyrinth and repeated treks up the mountain lack any dynamics, even when the ice monster steps in to help in combat. Tangled has a better round, though its combat arena stage design lacks the intrigue of a more curious stage like Toy Box or Monstropolis. Keeping levels open for combat encounters is a double-edged sword, as shown in Birth by Sleeps, which ultimately were pretty dull and uninteresting, PSP hardware limitations or not. Kingdom Hearts 3 definitely makes an effort to keep levels layered and fascinating, and for the greater part of its runtime, the stages stay compelling. But when Kingdom Hearts 3 gets experimental, things get very interesting. The Big Hero 6 and Pirates of the Caribbean worlds both structure their levels in different ways. The skyscraping city of San Francisco and the open waters of the Caribbean deliver their appeal uniquely, though digestibly. The former acts as a more open-ended battleground, with plenty of vertical dimension and flow motion opportunities. The latter is a mini version of something like Assassin's Creed 4 Black Flag, with small islands to explore and other ships to battle. I was admittedly put off at first by how different these worlds were from what I expected a Kingdom Hearts world to be, but in professing recognizable moments and delivering combat in digestible portions to intake, I grew to appreciate them. Kingdom Hearts 3's more experimental worlds spin the wheel of what to expect in a more creatively architected stage. Past games' worlds that tried to drastically shift their gameplay focus away from the main core always rubbed me the wrong way. Atlantica in Kingdom Hearts 1 and the Pride Lands in Kingdom Hearts 2 both introduced the player to more unfamiliar and less user-friendly combat. But these cases in Kingdom Hearts 3 present the world in a clever way without drastically neutering the player's combat and navigation options. For all their differences, they shine brightly, easily becoming some of my favorites of Kingdom Hearts 3's worlds. The experimentalism in these worlds complements a more relaxed difficulty because it gives designers opportunities to develop challenge in more unconventional ways. Building up your ship's strength while exploring the Caribbean was something I grew to love, even though it was essentially an altered form of grinding. 
Pursuing enemies on skyscrapers in San Francisco was exciting, giving me room to practice with flow motion. When Kingdom Hearts 3 takes advantage of these opportunities, a lighter difficulty makes a bit more sense. These moments preserve the fun of the combat without neutering the player and their skill set themselves. Admittedly, there's still a balance that I believe should be met. These more experiential occurrences can exist alongside more challenging combat encounters, which I feel is something the Murren crew could have managed if things were in their favor. There's clearly a future for Kingdom Hearts, so I'm hoping that Nomura can spearhead this equilibrium of challenge and experience. It's a goal I'd love for him to meet. With all this in mind, I think Kingdom Hearts 3's gameplay fulfilled its goal as well, though I'm not saying that it couldn't have been done any better. I could nitpick till who knows when, but when looking at my entire gameplay experience with Kingdom Hearts 3, I came away surprisingly satisfied. And this only grew with time. If there's one game that really encapsulated the idea of a slow burn, Kingdom Hearts 3 is certainly a contender. Even as the game became easier for me, I enjoyed the combat. I loved the flow of it all, the clever use of the Disney licenses for gameplay detours, and the design that, for the most part, really put each story in a grand and exciting light, one that complemented its respective world. I didn't think Kingdom Hearts 3 fulfilled that goal at first. After that first playthrough, I admittedly came away from it a bit disappointed, but with time, Kingdom Hearts 3 grew into something fun, exciting, and special. Through it all, I guess I came around. As you might recall, I tossed out an entire script about this game. I was ready to record the VO, in fact, but I don't think I was being as open about Kingdom Hearts 3 as I could have been. It's a game that's genuinely or otherwise been panned by fans and critics alike. And while I totally understand where everyone is coming from here, I just can't agree. Kingdom Hearts 3 is a game that manages to transcend the flaws that give it structure and deliver on something that several other games in the series were missing. It feels pure. Beyond the gummy phone selfies, the Instagram-esque loading screens, the corporate preservation of subject matter slithering into both the gameplay and world design, Kingdom Hearts 3 feels like just as much a passion project as Kingdom Hearts 1 did. And I think that's what the series needed at this point. I've always adored what many Japanese developers have accomplished when given total creative control. It's why I love Hideki Kamiya games, they're uncompromising. For all of the corporate influences they may have at the end of the day, they feel untouched, unshackled from the kind of focus group testing that morphs them into something homogenized and uninteresting. Kingdom Hearts 3 is as close to a passion project as a 2019 Square Enix game could ever be. It's so satisfying to see a game, even with so much weight from publishers and the community upon it, be as fulfilling as it is. For each flaw I found in Kingdom Hearts 3 were a handful of honest-to-god memorable moments that revitalized why I liked the series in the first place. Even better, the flaws feel human. It's pretty ridiculous that a game with so much connection to one of the biggest media conglomerates in the world manages to feel so personal, like there was genuine, for lack of a better term, heart behind it. That's why this game is so fulfilling to me. It's a human game, with all of the flaws that come with it. Upon finishing the game for the first time, I was asked by my roommate what I'd rate it on a scale of 1 to 10. I answered, but I won't say what it was, because at this point it doesn't matter. I don't agree with that number anymore. Once again, back to what I said at the start, this has been both the easiest game I've had to criticize and the hardest, because I can point out flaws till the sun goes down, but that doesn't mean a damn thing when the flaws are making a game feel so full of passion, so human in its misled execution. Against the good moments, the problems just can't hold water. I can't slap a numbered score on this game. There's no point. What truly matters is that I'm content with Kingdom Hearts 3. Yes, there are parts that I genuinely dislike. I can name off so, so many. But my time with Kingdom Hearts 3 was truly fulfilling. I played and enjoyed a game that, in spite of all of its missteps, managed to deliver closure in a truly flawed, truly human way. Despite my past views, no amount of anticipation can really overtake that. That's just how it all works. Kingdom Hearts 3 is a true example of a game being valuable not in rarity or quality, 
but like each step was something that deserves to exist in one way or another. I'm pretty happy with Kingdom Hearts 3. Fulfillment can do that for you.